good afternoon, or indeed good morning or good evening, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. You're very welcome to this annual UN Peacekeepers Conference, which is done in partnership with the United Nations Association of the United Kingdom, and indeed is the only conference in the UK dedicated to peacekeepers. My name is Paul O'Neill. I'm the Director of Military Sciences at the Royal United Services Institute in London. The 29th of May is International Day of the UN Peacekeeper. It's an opportunity to pay tribute to the men and women who have served or are serving on UN peacekeeping operations. This year, while understandably many are focused on the war in Ukraine and or are concerned about tensions in the Indo-Pacific, we should not forget that currently there are 12 UN peacekeeping missions on three continents, with over 86,900 peacekeepers from 121 different countries currently deployed. And peacekeeping is not safe. Since 1948, there have been almost 4,300 fatalities amongst peacekeepers, with 17 in the first four months of 2023 alone. To commemorate the deaths of all those who've lost their lives in the service of humanity, the United Nations Association Westminster branch is organizing a wreath laying at the Cenotaph on the 25th of May. Normally, that event would be part of the conference, but in recent years, with COVID and the refurbishment of Rusi's building on Whitehall, we have had to separate the two events. I sincerely hope that next year we can bring them back together without losing the value that an online event brings in terms of access to the very best speakers and indeed the very best audience who can dial in from wherever they are in the world. This year, I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be joined by Mr. Nicholas Hayson, who is the Special Representative to the Secretary General and Head of the UN Mission in South Sudan as our keynote conversationalist. Now, I've mentioned that peacekeeping is not safe, but neither is it easy. Today's multidimensional peacekeeping operations are called on not only to maintain peace and security, but also to facilitate the political process, protect civilians, assist in the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration of former combatants, support the organization of elections, protect and promote human rights, and assist in restoring the rule of law. Arguably, therefore, peacekeeping operations are some of the most complex missions going on anywhere in the world. That requires a high level of skill amongst peacekeepers. So this year, our panel will focus on how peacekeepers are trained. Our very good friend, Dr. Georgina Holmes, will be joined by an expert panel to discuss this. I would like to say thank you to them, thank you to the team who organized this event, and thank you to you for joining us today as we acknowledge the selfless dedication of those over one million peacekeepers who have served or are serving on UN peacekeeping missions. I'll now hand over to Dr. Georgina Holmes. Georgina, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, as Paul has said, we are obviously dealing um, with the challenges of today's very dangerous, complex and high risk um, operating environments. And although training is uh, our focus today, I would like to point out that training itself isn't really a magic bullet and it, training alone cannot necessarily lead to the cultural transformations and operational transformations that are required. And so to this end, we're honoured to, to be joined today by our panel of expert practitioners, Ramona Tarini, Hester Paneras, and um, Michael Freidwaller, who will all discuss the central question, what are the dilemmas in training military and police personnel as peacekeepers in the modern operating environment? Before we begin our discussion, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists one by one. So first to speak will be Ramona Tahiri. She is the Executive Director of the Peace Operations Training Institute, um, where she's worked for over 10 years with a range of agencies, including uh, of UN agencies and organisations, to create specialist training on a range of, um, material, of subjects, including international humanitarian law, protection of civilians and conflict resolution. Um, and she, uh, then we will hopefully have Hester um, Paneras, who will be speaking if, um, next. She is currently the head of Institutional Operational Partnership Service at U United Nations Office in the African Union. 
She has held this position since um, April 2018. And prior to that, um, Hester became the first woman to be deployed as a police commissioner in a UN peacekeeping operation when she was appointed uh, as the police commissioner in the African Union United Nations mission of Darfur Unimid from 2013 to 2015. And after that, we will have Colonel Michael Friedweiler, who, will, who is a Swiss Army officer. Um, he served there since he was served there since uh, 1989, and he's currently serving as the deputy commander of the Swiss International Command, which is the national authority of all peace support operations abroad. So each participant will talk for 10 minutes and we'll then open up the discussion for the rest of the audience. If you have any questions, please do put them into the Q&A box, which is on your screen. Um, but you can add them at any point in the time to allow us to be able to address these questions at the very end. So Ramona, I would like you to call on you to speak first. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me fine? All right. Um, you can change to the next slide. Okay. Thank you to our gracious hosts. I'm delighted to be here to discuss some of the dilemmas facing both the brave people who serve on missions and the entities that help prepare them for service. So we know peace operations mandates have grown to be very broad, very complex, and what some call fragmented, as in the mandates of modern missions include not just many tasks, but many dissimilar tasks. So like Paul mentioned, instead of just security-related tasks like protecting civilians, disarmament, enforcing ceasefires, peace operations now perform a lot of other peace-building and cross-cutting tasks like promoting gender equality, helping with elections, security sector reform, and so on. So obviously this causes an inherent training dilemma. How are peacekeepers supposed to be trained on all of these disparate tasks? Now training is a troop and police contributing country responsibility. So each nation that deploys peace operations personnel has to make sure the people they're deploying have a good basis of knowledge. But all of these 121 or so nations have different capacities for training, right? Some don't have dedicated national peacekeeping training centers at all. And the existing centers have different resources, levels of education of their students, different numbers of instructors. Um, some lack proper facilities for women, some lack funding. And not all potential peacekeepers have the ability to travel to a center. And if they can, perhaps not the ability to stay for an extended period of time. So one solution to overcoming some of these barriers to pre-deployment training is online learning, which is my specialty. You can change to the next slide. Um, the organization I serve, the Peace Operations Training Institute, was founded in 2008 by Dr. Harvey Langholz to increase the training capacity of troop and police contributing countries. We're a nonprofit, non-governmental organization governed by a board of directors, of which Hester is actually part of our BOD. Um, that provides e-learning on topics related to peace operations. We meet the demand for an average of 100,000 enrollments in our courses every year. We have a curriculum of 30 courses in English. We offer translations in French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Arabic. And all of our courses are downloadable, self-paced to take on your own schedule. You can go to the next slide. So although we're not part of the United Nations, there is a group of member states of the UN that provides aegis and oversight for our work. This helps keep a balance between our independence and partiality and still staying connected to the UN sphere. Each meeting is chaired and hosted by a member state. So this summer will be the permanent mission of Canada and it was previously hosted by the Netherlands and the UK, traditionally some of the biggest supporters of e-learning for peace operations personnel. You can change to the next slide. We create our courses in partnership with experts and various entities. So we have courses on cultural property protection and peace operations co-published with UNESCO, Mine Action Awareness created in partnership with UN Mine Action Service, Ethics and Peace Operations created in partnership with King's College London and other such courses. Next slide. All of our courses are free to students at national peacekeeping training centers. 
in Africa, Latin America, and South Asia, where many peacekeepers come from. It's free to all military and police personnel in these regions as well, and our training is free to all African Union, European Union, and UN mission personnel. Most of our courses are actually just free uh, for anyone, regardless of eligibility status. So I encourage you to go online and sign up and provide us feedback. It's www.peaceopstraining.org. Um, next slide. So we aim to increase the capacity of centers by offering our e-learning to them to use as supplements and prerequisites to their classroom training or to provide training they don't have courses on. We work with over 45 centers around the world in this effort, and it's our flagship program. So this type of blended learning, we try to bridge the gap between the tasks peacekeepers are supposed to have some knowledge about and what centers can actually realistically provide. Um, but we try to make this training accessible to anyone anywhere, even if they're not at a center. Next slide. Students need to be online just to register for the training, download it, and they can take it offline and they have to come back online to take their final exam if they choose to do so. We have videos, virtual flashcards, interactive modules, and other multimedia enhancements, but those are all optional. Um, so it's a really low tech approach. We try to make sure we serve the people who might not have continuous broadband internet access. But it's very important to know that accessibility has to start with a website itself, right? So we wanted to add an interactive map to our website. It sounds very simple. And we looked at other websites that have a similar feature. And on one website, the map took nine minutes to load on a simulated 3G wireless network which is one way we test the features to make sure they're accessible. So that just shows, you know, when you start to make things visually appealing or more interactive, you could lose accessibility. And we still have to be mindful of those we aim to serve. Some missions are in remote areas and some of the largest troop and police contributing countries have regions with difficult internet accessibility. So Bangladesh, India, Rwanda, Pakistan, Ghana, Senegal. So we know that internet access via mobile device in these countries is at a much higher rate, but training on a phone is very limiting. Our courses are quite long and it would be difficult to read on a phone. So this is part of the reason we've started to convert some of our trainings to audiobooks, but it still presents a challenge. Uh, next slide. So I could talk about accessibility probably for an hour, but you know, so in order for the training to be useful, it has to be accessible. It has to be practical. It has to be written in language that's easy to understand. It has to be translated in different languages. Um, but it also has to be relevant to the challenges peacekeepers are facing. And three areas where we and our partners think training is needed is the use of technology in peace operations, sexual and gender-based violence, and the health of peace operations personnel. So everyone deployed on peace operations has varying experiences with technology. Dr. Walter Dorn, an expert in this subject, has created a course covering the technologies you'll find on a mission, and we're slated to release it later this summer. So why is this important? For example, night vision devices have allowed peacekeepers to monitor their surroundings more effectively. But in one particular mission, personnel weren't properly trained on how to use the equipment. And unfortunately, they accidentally exposed some expensive night vision equipment to direct sunlight and ruined it. Now missions are using, you know, GIS, GPS, satellite phones, things like that. And we need to make sure personnel have some background knowledge on these topics and can use them in order to take advantage of them most effectively. The next topic we've been tackling is sexual and gender-based violence. The International Peace Institute in New York has written a fantastic course for us, and we will be releasing it in the coming months. We also have a course on preventing violence against women created in partnership with the Geneva Center for Security Governance and a three course suite on women, peace and security agenda with UN women. Now, it seems like a lot to have five courses dedicated to these issues, but it's really crucial to parse out these subjects and have peacekeepers not just understand the surface level issues related to conduct and discipline, but also the profound imbalance of power that makes certain actions unethical the consequences of their actions for themselves, for their community, for their mission, the UN as a whole, and the broad spectrum of topics related to gender and how they permeate into almost every aspect of peace. 
The third topic is health. And since peacekeeping started after the Second World War, illness has actually been the number one cause of death of peace operations personnel. Um, you know, it's harsh conditions, um, lack of resources. It's just a difficult climate to be living in. And um, so more than accidents, more than malicious attacks, it's it's been a real challenge. And so in cooperation with the World Health Organization, we created a course on the health of peace operations personnel that's freely available on our website now to anyone who feels like signing up. Um, the course covers not just your traditional uh, concerns like malaria, um, COVID, communicable disease, but it also presents practical information on safeguarding one's mental health when on a mission. I'm very happy to see the tide shift on this. Um, and nations really start to offer mental health awareness education to their personnel. It's very important. Uh, next slide. So in sum, we just must make sure that beyond having reasonable mission mandates, which is a political issue, that training is accessible and helps peacekeepers deal with the issues that threaten their safety, like mine action and health, but also the issues that threaten the well-being of those they serve. And we can only do this in partnership with each other. So I invite any organization or individual to get in touch with me and figure out how we can work together in bringing e-learning to peace operations personnel. Next slide is my final slide. That's it from me. I thank our sponsors. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romaina. That's that's um, that's a, a very, with very in interesting conversation and discussion about the kind of technical issues around peacekeeping training, and also looking forward to where training now needs to go. Um, in terms of dealing with mental health and also um, gender issues and technology, all key areas in terms of the evolution of peacekeeping. So I now would like to turn to our second presenter, um, who will be the, um, will be Michael. Um, Michael, um, if you'd like to start your video and your and your ten minute discussion, thank you very much. to be here with you today. Um, I'm calling from uh, Switzerland, and uh, Switzerland is actually uh, a quite peculiar system for the peacekeepers, because as you very well know, our military service is a conscription service. Basically, uh, our people do about uh, one year of military service, but they uh, extend that on a period of about 10 years with repetition courses and a basic training repetition course and so on. Um, if you go in ranks, then you have more time in military service and you, you serve longer. So you serve uh, more time and therefore also more years. Now, um, the, the, the peacekeeping for Switzerland is actually a voluntary service which means that uh, all peacekeepers who go abroad are doing that voluntarily. They are announcing themselves in our, in our, um, in our center and uh, we are testing them and then afterwards we're training them and then we send them to uh, uh, in operations and we bring them back. Uh, so that is, that is uh, all what we do here. Now, uh, what, what is the peculiar, peculiarism about what I'm, what I'm saying is actually that People who come and serve, they mainly are not only military, but they do also have uh, various other um, jobs outside of the military service. So they come with a lot of experience and uh, therefore we have a uh, even uh, more difficult way to train them in bringing them up back to a certain military standard. But we have less to do when we have to deal with the complexity of uh, the, the, the operations they're in, because basically they bring, in, they bring with them other, other um, skills that they bring out of the civilian life. So it's, it's a mix of training we are doing between uh, awareness of the environment, uh, the threats in the region and preparing them on the threats in the region. And then, of course, the complexity and uh, uh, of the missions, their role in the missions. And this is where I can only uh, 
say that my predecessor explained very well all the uh, different things we are training them with and we are also using uh, part of this uh, e-learning system to, to support them and uh, we are doing uh, uh, kind of, 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 of uh, role, role games and uh, training them to be aware of the situation they're going in. Uh, the most difficult part is not so much the military training, so bring them back or bring them uh, up to the, the military needs uh, or the military skills they need. Uh, the, the, the most difficult part is the two others, is this particular role they have as peacekeepers in the world. That was addressed also earlier and, and that's the point where we have to, to, to explain to them that they're not only a military person in Switzerland, but they're a Swiss military person in a UN mission, and all this role is very important for them to understand. And the and the second part is about the awareness of the environment, understanding where they're living in, how they're living in, and um, what that means for their actual everyday life in the in the theater. Michael, could um, I just pause you? Sorry, Michael, would I be able to pause you just to ask if you'd be able to share your video if, if that's possible? Actually, it's uh, it. Uh, so sorry, I, 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 I. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you. Are you seeing it now? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, yes, I, thank I, you. I, I forgot to push the second button. <laughs> um, okay, so th that's that's the that's uh, the, the 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 what we're doing actually now uh, uh, in Switzerland. Our 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 center, our training center, is actually a recognized uh, UN and NATO training center. We are working very much with, uh, we're doing a Swiss UN uh, uh, observers course and uh, staff officers course, which is an international course where we invite a lot of uh, other countries uh, training with us. Um, th there, the, the idea behind that was to train the peacekeepers as they would be uh, deployed afterwards, so together with other nations, in order to learn how to live together with other nations and work together with other nations. Um, and also to support the training capacity of, uh, as we heard earlier, those countries who are not as um, as able as we are to, to train. And uh, the second thing we are doing, and this is also in order to, to, to uh, learn from each other and uh, understand better the complexity, is that we're also training our people from our foreign affairs, from our aid development uh, group and civilians, who, um, who are going to be peacekeepers or who, or who are going to be deployed in humanitarian aid or then in, in, um, in missions abroad, be it for the, for the nation or be it for, for NGOs. And uh, so that they bring in their experience too in order to crisscross the, uh, the experience of all together. So that's about what we're doing. And I'm very pleased to be hearing um, your questions and giving some answers afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was, um, again, another very interesting discussion concerning some of the innovations that you are engaged in at the moment in your training centre. Um, so we would now like um, to um, for Hester Paneras to speak. We, we do believe that she's been having some audio issues, so apologies if there are some problems, but hopefully um, it's, it's the technical issues have been sorted now. Um, Hester, if you'd like to sort of offer your views, um, particularly from the perspective of a practitioner in the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I want to start off by saying that I think that we have to commemorate those peacekeepers who have given their life to ensure peace in the world. Um, it's very interesting that peacekeeping is not in the UN Charter. And the first time that the term peacekeeping was used was in 1956 to describe the mission that was deployed to monitor the armistice agreement on the Suez conflict between Israel and Egypt. However, UN peacekeeping operations have been expanded and have proven highly adaptable and have contributed significantly to the successful resolution of conflicts and to a declining number of conflicts 
over the two decades or nearly three decades previously. However, we now find that there is a reversal of some of the trends and there is a wide concern on conflict that is busy outpacing the ability of the United Nations peace operations to respond. The spread of violent extremism, also with long simmering local or regional conflicts and the growing aspirations of populations for change is placing pressure on governments and the international system to respond. In Africa, when uh, in various of the uh, missions, there is no peace to keep. If you look at a mission like Mali, where, like in, 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 in Mali, where the government currently is not seen as the legal government and has been suspended by the African Union, where there is a threat of terrorism and extremism, how does a leader in a peace operation deal with it? How does the ordinary foot soldier or police officer or civilian person then deal with these situations? How do you apply the principles what we have in peacekeeping? Peace operations therefore struggle to achieve the objectives and effectiveness. And we therefore have to see how does training keep track of this? There are some of the training packages and I know for instance, the, the police is currently reviewing their package as well. But are we really updating um, our trainings to deal with these contemporary threats? The HIPPO report have on the other hand also, and I think there's a bit of a confusion sometimes when we talk to people, we still refer to peacekeeping and even the action for peacekeeping and peacekeeping plus um, came into being, but already in 2015, it was identified that it should be referred to peace operations so that we can embrace the full spectrum of responses required. And, uh, invest in strengthening the underlying analysis strategy and planning that leads to more successful designs of missions. However, apart from a structural change in headquarters, um, we are still talking about peacekeeping and then we have our special political missions. What is expected from the different peacekeepers in the field? nowadays is much different from what it was when it was patrolling in a jeep and monitoring the environment. The military are in situations where they often have to face belligerents and they are not within the spectrum of the um, uh, principles of the UN peacekeeping operations able to act offensively, but they can act only defensively. How do we need to train them then to deal with these situations? On the other hand, the police, and uh, especially in the last couple of years, the role of the police have become much more important. And we can divide the police responsibilities mainly in two areas. And that is the, um, uh, 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 protection of civilians, where they have to interact with the communities and they have to collect information, they have to uh, be on the ground, they have to uh, support uh, victims of crimes or other activities. And then on the other hand, there is the capacity building. So what we need to take into consideration when we train these officers is also how to keep the balance. Because we are in situations where very often the, the very population that we have to interact with and the same government uh, police forces or authorities that we have to interact with are, are on two uh, different spectrums. Um, they are not 
seeing eye to eye and the very population do not accept their own authorities. At the same time, we have to build capacity in those police forces while their own communities don't want them. If you move too much to the one side, the other side see you as not being impartial in the process. So how do we in our, and I'm asking more questions in this regard than giving answers. How do we make sure that psychologically and in the soft skill side of things, our peacekeepers are prepared? A police officer that goes out do not, especially the individual police officer, do not act in a group and on command. They have to take initiatives on their own. And that is why the skill sets that these people need to have have to entail a lot of soft skills and it needs to allow them to make decisions on their own and to interact with these populations. While being a police officer back in the countries, they suddenly have to become negotiators, mediators, and uh, fulfill various other roles. They have to bring the communities and the police together. So is our current packages really addressing that? So those are the questions that I have. I want to bring um, on board a couple of the things that, that the Action for Peacekeeping um, program have uh, indicated and which we really need to take into consideration when we do our training. Is do we understand the collective coherence within the framework of the political direction that the mission needs to take. Is there an understanding for that? Because every peacekeeper need to understand that they are acting within this political framework, irrespective of what is being done. Is there strategic and operational thinking to ensure that there's integration in this, uh, uh, when they perform their duties, in the mission. Because very often we also find that the different components work on their own and they do not collaborate. So one of the main areas where a shortcoming has been identified when I was in the mission and currently, which I'm working with the African Union also on, on peacekeeping and monitoring uh, what is going on in the missions in Africa. This is one and remains one of the biggest challenges is how do we ensure integration and oneness of purpose, especially from the police and the military side with a huge turnover of personnel that rotates on an annual basis and maybe sometimes a little bit longer. What is the capabilities and the mindsets? Are the people prepared psychologically for the environment where they go. I'm currently busy with another uh, workshop where we are looking at training materials. And one of the police officers from a mission constantly point out that he feels that there is a need for this. And if we talk to our peacekeepers, I think very often we do not really have the necessary preparation. We tell them that it's dangerous, but are we really, um, uh, uh, preparing them psychologically as well. Hester, then, can I just give you one more minute, please? And then we all, okay. thank you, thank then, you. Then the accountability of peacekeepers and on the other side also accountability to the peacekeepers are things that we need to take into consideration. So I think what I want to say in, 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 um, uh, in, in conclusion on this is, how do we take into consideration what is in the action for peacekeeping to adjust our training programs in this. And I thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Hester. I think Hester highlights uh, some of the issues within the actual operating environment where the training often can be delivered in, in packages, perhaps it's more process driven uh, or process focused. And uh, it's as and it's bite sized very often. Whereas Hester obviously draws attention to the the issues of of the longer term um, uh, kind of planning that the officers particularly need to be engaged in, um, which perhaps the existing training doesn't fully address. 
So with that, I would like to now um, turn to the audience to, to um, it, enable you to join in the discussion. Um, we do have several questions um, already in the Q&A chat box. Please do add more as we go along. Um, the first one that I'd like to um, uh, propose is by Joe Morley Davies. He says, violent groups and state actors both engage in disinformation in order to discourage support uh, for peacekeeping and motivate violent attacks. What training, if any, is being made available for the rapidly developing informational aspects of peacekeeping? So I wondered if this might perhaps be a question for Michael and also um, uh, Ramona, perhaps you could each just answer that question in, in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Perhaps Michael could go first. I, I haven't heard all the question. That's, that's my problem. Okay. I heard that I was asked to answer, but I haven't heard the question actually. That's no problem. I'll read it again. So Joe Morley Davis asks, violent groups and state actors both engage in disinformation in order to discourage support for peacekeeping and motivate violent attacks. What training, if any, is being made available for the rapidly developing informational aspects of peacekeeping? Ah, very interesting. Well, <clears throat> what 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 we're trying to 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 do there actually with in on on um, in our in our various training uh, elements the, the one part is the the, the purely self defense activity that is clearly which is um, militarily and uh, as well as police officers are very well aware of what they have to do at that time the second part is the communication aspect and the communication aspect there we train them in order to know how or better said, that there can be um, a target for communications when they are in uh, in uh, in missions, and we try to explain to them, and that's what what uh, the, my predecessor said. We we try to explain them what the the scope of the mission is, and then what role they have in this mission, and they should keep that in mind whenever they do something in order not to become an asset for um, for communication against the mission actually it's quite difficult because they are, of course they're caught in uh, in positions where they don't want to be do to, to be done but our communication uh, communication specialists here in the house try to teach them how to to, or to have that back in mind when they do something thank you and Ramona. I agree. This isn't something that we have tackled. You know, sometimes guidance and policy has to come first. And I think uh, peace operations kind of lack an overarching strategic approach uh, to this issue, right? Uh, disinformation that exacerbates everything, you know, the conflict and their position there. So this isn't something we've approached directly, but would like to at some point. Okay, thank you. Um, Ewan Grant from London, um, he says he served in an EU mission in Bosnia um, as a liaison to UN military. And his question is, uh, what indicators do the speakers use regarding likely effectiveness of military police liaison? Um, and also how well are local factors considered? So perhaps this is a question that Hester specifically could answer. Um, and I just also wondered whether or not both Michael and Ramona could reflect on this question in relation to how do you actually properly uh, evaluate the effectiveness of, of peacekeeping training? You know, what, what kind of processes and procedures do you have in place within your training centres and how could they be improved? So Hester, perhaps if you could um, comment first, please. Well, yep. um... We have. Sorry, Michael. Hester's just talking first, and then we'll turn to you afterwards. Thank you. I think the effect. And now let me first go to the types of training that is being presented. And and uh, personally, I have a huge uh, problem with overdose of PowerPoint, and that is unfortunately what we have in many trainings. Trainings are not done adult-based, and it's very often done in big groups. Now, if it is done like that, 
it makes it very difficult to really evaluate. Now, there's a training package that we have that I was involved in. I can give this as an example for the African Union, and it was specifically for the pre-deployment of police officers. And it was totally built on um, uh, adult-based learning. Even the theoretical parts was done in self-discovery through different exercises uh, uh, and other training methodologies. We had a pre and a post training or uh, in the beginning, the first day, they would write a test and at the end they write a test as well. And, and it was basically the same test, but we could um, identify the percentage of improvement of the knowledge. And some people would go from 20% to 80 or 90 or 100% um, uh, uh, through the methodology. Now, of course, we can use this methodology or, or this evaluation method also when one um, uh, 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 do the one-way presentation uh, uh, style of training as well. You can also test it to make sure what was said was taken in. And then the second thing that we did on evaluation is we have uh, after a few months and, and when these people who got the first trainings were deployed, we had discussions with the mission management to ask how they've experienced the difference on deployed officers before and people being deployed with the current uh, uh, um, training package that they were given. Now, this package has been in place now for four years and it's proven very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hester. Uh, Michael. I couldn't have said it better, actually. It's, I, I fully agree with, uh, with uh, what's, what, what was just said. We also try to, um, what we do a lot is to use people who were in the various theaters to train the people who are going there. Um, first of all, to, to try to, to, to show them the specificities of the mission and the, the peculiarities of the, uh, of the environment in which they're going to train. And secondly, to explain their functions, because mainly they're taking over a function that another Swiss had before him. So often it is giving, uh, uh, trying to, 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 to use the lessons they learned in the theater to then train the next ones who are going there. That's one of our methods. The, the second point is that we are um, doing a lot of debriefings. Now, the, the, the question was for, for, for Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we also have Swiss um, soldiers there. And we use, of course, uh, the, the, we debrief them at the end of their tour there in order to know what in their training was good or bad for their mission, what should be better or should be done better or should be done differently. And very often, the main, the main point which comes is actually the awareness of the specificity of this mission. That's something that's very difficult to give someone who has not been in mission before, who has not been in that region before, who doesn't know how the, the people think in these regions. And that's probably the most difficult part. This is why we use the people who've been there in order to try to explain and give the idea how it is. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And now, Ramona, um, how would you consider um, measuring effectiveness of training? Sure. So I would say with online tra training, there is a lot more scrutiny on if it's effective or not. So that's a huge focus of our work. So we offer a pre-test and a post-test. We compare the scores. We offer feedback forms, focus groups. But what we're most interested in are the surveys we send to our students three and nine months after they have taken the course. And we want to see, you know, have you deployed since taking the course? Did you use the materials? Did you find it valuable? Um, and the problem with that is it's hard to get responses nine months after someone has done something. And so this is just a constant challenge we face in our work. Hmm. Yeah, okay. And I think one of the issues as well is that quite often just pure numbers, like numbers of people that have gone through training is, is seen as an indicator of uh, you know, how cultural change is taking place. But of course, 
that's not necessarily you know accurate it's just it is literally numbers and again that's where it can quite often feel a bit like um, training is the magic bullet you know there's a problem let's let's develop some training around this um it's it's particularly seen you know um in any training around gender mainstreaming gender equality and gender and sexual violence and conflict as well um Graham Davies um, has actually asked a, 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 an interesting question, which I'd be, I would be keen to hear your views on. He says, of course, we've been focusing on training of frontline staff, um, tactical level peacekeepers primarily. Um, but he says, what about um, those that are desk bound, the bureaucrats or the political figures in New York, Geneva, etc whose decisions have direct consequences for peacekeepers deployed both in terms of policy decisions on rules of engagement and then also mission priorities and negotiations does anyone have any views on this in terms of what training um would sort of support um, better decision making at a more strategic level Tessa, could we perhaps ask you first Thank you. Yeah, I can give you a, a, a practical example of what is um, currently taking place um, with the UN Senior Mission Leadership Program uh, that is, is um, done uh, once or twice a year. Um, for instance, headquarters have with their directors at um, DPO, DPPA, um, uh, the directors of the different regions are sent on these courses as well, to at least have that interaction with the um, Karana mission, uh, and where they have to also uh, make certain decisions to give them a better understanding of how peace operations take place. So I think it's very important that, that the headquarters staff, for instance, also attend some of the operational trainings that are taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Hester. Um, Ramona. It's not my purview, so I, I don't feel qualified to answer, but I, you know, I do, I am heartened by the fact that a lot of the people who are in decision-making positions, they have been peacekeepers in the past. And, and so they have gone through many of these trainings themselves. Okay, thank you. And Michael, any views on this? Yes, actually, we we send a lot of uh, voluntary national contributions to work as uh, to work in the headquarters in order to 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 influence actually the uh, the the way to see at the at the missions, and they are as uh, as Ramona just said, they are mainly uh, former peacekeepers we had in missions who are now going to work and bring their knowledge in the in the system. So I believe, of course. The, you're you're embedded in a system which is with which isn't in the same uh, in the same environment, and I believe that's the, the the main problem we're facing everywhere in the world is that when we are in a headquarter or basically for me being in Switzerland, I'm not in the same environment as in Mali or in Congo, of course, and and Monusco and and Minusma are living something completely different as we are living here, and the, we have to be aware of that, and I think that's the main problem of any headquarters is that he has to be aware of the or they have to be aware of the situation in which the peacekeepers are working but i don't think that they lack of training actually okay thank you um I, a question that i i'm interested in is I, i've of having observed um different pre-deployment trainings that have um, been conducted by troop contributing militaries I was quite taken by the lack of um, joined up um, training between police and military, particularly around protection of civilians, conflict resolution and negotiation. And I wondered, you know, what what's your views on on this in terms of where we are now, the challenges of training and, and how perhaps more joined up training between police and military could um, effectively mitigate some of the challenges we're currently experiencing um, around protection of civilians and conflict resolution. Um, Hester, could I ask you first? Yeah, there are two views. Now, again, you know, uh, and currently I'm working with the partnership between the U United Nations and the African Union. 
And uh, I think there are quite a couple of lessons that can be learned from the African Union as well on how they are approaching things currently, is it is compulsory that the military has a part in their modules on the police, their responsibilities, their structures, et cetera. The same with the civilians. The police need to have it on the military and so forth. So I think very often, um, especially when it is uh, component specific uh, training, they focus on what that component is supposed to do. And I think the, the uh, uh, cross-cutting collaboration is not really um, getting the attention. At one stage, I had a look at the training for uh, military battalions. And in the whole package, there was one sentence that said that you have to collaborate with the police, but not how, not what the police is doing, why you need to collaborate and so forth. So that is one way, I think, uh, um, where this cross uh, uh, component uh, issues can be addressed. It's not always possible to have integrated training uh, because of the dynamics and distance and so forth. Uh, but I think in the missions, especially in the induction training, also induction training can be looked at to look more on the uh, collaborative aspects of the mission and not only have a sentence to say you need to work together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Michael, any thoughts? Yes. I Again, I think I think it's very important to 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 train together, to know together where we're going, what is ex expected from us. This is why we started about uh, six years ago to to train together with civilians, to train together with uh, police officers, to have courses which are to done together, other courses which are done separate but at the same place. So the instructions are quite the same um, and and I think that is for for our people at least is very important to have that um, now it's easy to say it when you're doing it but I think it would be very worse that uh, that it, it it's 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 followed in other regions too we try to we, we're working together with the um, as well with the KPCT in uh, in um, in Ghana and with the uh, IPSCT in Kenya, and we're trying to bring, or even there, we're trying to bring this uh, this approach where the uh, the holistic view of a mission is important, and not only one speciality uh, bringing in, because that's the, the people mainly know what they have to do and why they are serving in 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 the missions in their functions, but often the 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 holistic approach to the mission is is more difficult to be brought together. That's what we're trying. Why, why we're trying to, to to train together and bring people together in training in order to be able to work together then in the missions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Ramona. Oh, they couldn't have said it better. And I think, you know, people don't really realize that many nations have separate facilities all together. So instead of one national peacekeeping training center where everyone goes for de pre-deployment training. They have a center for police for pre-deployment training and a center for military for pre-deployment training. And Switzerland is trying to, you know, unite those things, bring police into those centers. And I think that's a very valiant effort. It's much needed. Okay. We're a small country. This is why we're doing it. <laughs> Thank you. So we, um, a comment now from um, Nadia um, Golochagulu. Um, if I've pronounced her name correctly, she's asked, how would you assess the degree of agency given to the local population and local actors through peacekeeping operations? I think we're, although we're looking specifically at training, there is a question there actually in terms of, you know, how, how can you bring local actors into training processes and should you, and if you should, which, what would you do? How, um, so, Perhaps, Ramona, perhaps this is something that you might like to look at or answer. Yeah, it's a huge question. I feel like we could talk about it uh, for a very long time. But, and, you know, something that we've been trying to do and a lot of institutions have been trying to do is present lessons learned and case studies. And so to take mission leadership and people who have a lot of mission experience and to 
reflect their experiences directly into the training because their experiences have been with the local population and they know what the local population needs, has wanted, um, has had an issue with. And so taking training that's theoretical, right, and, and adding a case study and adding lessons learned and sharing those lessons between mission leadership and also just your average peacekeeper, I think is very important. Okay, thank you. Michael? Yeah, I would add to what uh, Ramon just said that there's a there's a, a, a there's a big uh, a process which is going on in 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 regions where so those submissions happen. So I was talking about the the uh, KPTC earlier. I was we talking about the ICPST. I was I'm, I, we could talk about AMP in Mali. It's it's all these uh, training centers where basically the locals are trained together with the neighbors in order to uh, to be able on one side to do to do peacekeeping by themselves or to, to 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 be peacekeepers but on the other side also to integrate of course their view in the uh, in the training and their perspectives and i think that's very that's very valuable if you exchange between these centers and the other training centers in uh, in 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 the western countries where you of course go with some uh, a lot of things are absolutely normal for us which are not for them and on the contrary the same so things are normal for them which would be completely strange for us and i think here you have to exchange in order to to to, to get a, set, a basis where you you could work together and find the the the, the outlines of a, of a training which is worth for everyone on the same level. And we are trying to do that with some trainers we sent there. These are people from our from our training center or people who have been in missions and go there uh, to train. And then afterwards we bring them back and try to use their knowledge here in Switzerland to understand better the region and understand better how we should train our people in order to, 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 um, to be uh, of best use in the missions. It's uh, but it's a very uh, it's on a very low level. It's not spread out, and I think there we could use much more of um, of uh, e-learning elements where we could uh, work together on that and uh, try to 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 bring up some uh, broader uh, training sentences where where we could do things together. But it's a very 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 important questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hester. Yeah, the way I understand it is when you are in the mission, if I understood the question correctly, how do you integrate the local population in the host nation into training as well? The, the stakeholders, actors, um, that's how I understood it. Now, um, that is a very um, dynamic situation because I also think it depends on um, we need to look at a peacekeeper in Mali currently. Are we going to do some of the trainings in the mission together with the local population? If we're not sure where exactly they stand, we are not sure who is the opposing parties and who not. We don't know who the spoilers are. Uh, but the closest that I have, have, have seen was... Um, uh, when I was in, in Darfur is where we would train community uh, volunteers on certain aspects, get their views as well uh, uh, um, uh, on how to um, create a protective environment in, in, in the, uh, uh, by some of their own initiatives as well. And then what we did, we uh, also at some stage we had the language assistants do some trainings with the mission personnel um, in the sense of them getting a better understanding of some of the topics so that the messages do not go missing in translation. Uh, so th those are the closest that I think uh, if you look at the situation like, like um, in Somalia currently, uh, where you are not sure uh, in the same household, you can have somebody who is part of the uh, alleged terrorist group and you have a person who work for the military or the police in the same household. 
so it, it makes it a, a little bit um, difficult, but I think with creativity, one can get the messages through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ramona. Oh yeah, I already answered. Um, thank you, sorry. <laughs> um, I think um, one of the issues as well um, facing um, engaging with local populations that I've heard of is this question around ethics. And, you know, it, there's, there's a challenge, particularly around some protection of civilians related training. There's a challenge of um, ensuring that um, uh, if you do bring local people into it, I'm just talking so, on the subjects of, on sensitive subjects like um, uh, sexual um, violence or, um, how do you actually get the balance so that you don't unintentionally re-traumatise populations when you engage with them? Um, and I just wondered if any of you had had any experience with, you know, directly working with people and local populations in terms of building this kind of training, or is it, or do you have specialist teams? Is this something that you consider in terms of the ethics around developing trainings? Um, perhaps I could ask Michael first. Um, I, I only can speak uh, of the experience of plannings in uh, of those kind of actions in uh, in missions, and um, we had we had there two um, two main elements, but but, but it, probably it was a bit of a of a hazard that two Swiss were working together there. But that was, uh, we had um, a legat and at the same time a legal advisor and at the same time we had the planning, the, 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 the operation planning officer in the, in the same headquarters. And uh, they were working together very, 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 very uh, near together in order not to, to, to be sure that what the, the action which was planned was according to all the uh, international uh, law and uh, to all the rules the mission had and all the, uh, all the possibilities of, of acting of the, of the mission itself. Uh, basically, uh, it was the, 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 the experience I, I, I talk about was in, in, in Mali where actually the French had a, an action and the, the, the UN uh, MINUSPA was supporting uh, in the, the, the local uh, population. So it was a, it was a crisscross uh, mission and we were actually, uh, well, MINUSMA at that, that, that time was supporting the, the local um, um, the, the local population uh, as protection of civilian, but that was very closely organized between Legad, between uh, the French uh, planning officer and, 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 and the MINUSMA planning officer. This is why probably it worked quite well. Okay, thank you. And Ramona, any views on the ethics related to training? Sure. Yeah, so we work with UN Women for most of our uh, gender awareness materials, and they actually, I feel, do a good job at working with women's organizations that are local and, and more grassroots organizations. So I think, you know, in one calendar year, they announced they worked with over a thousand uh, local women's initiatives. And those initiatives, I think, provide a safe space or they they aim to provide a safe space um, for women to come express uh, how they feel about certain topics and I think that's better done by locals than uh, large organizations coming in so I think UN Women has done a very good job at that. Okay thank you. Hester. Yeah I, I, th I think there are two things that we need to um, take into consideration. The one is with the host populations. Now I, I'm careful to always call it training because it was not done by the training unit itself. It, it, it depends on who was working with your reforms, with your community policing, with your uh, 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 gender, based violence or gender issues and so forth, uh, who would do the sensitizations. Now, one way to overcome some of the sensitivities was to identify women in the communities who were women, um, not necessarily senior female leaders, but who, who were um, standing out as having some leadership role and also who were volunteers for the um, community policing 
uh, and community safety programs. And they were given specifically uh, a, a counselor training and uh, they were also prepared to help the mission to roll out some of the messages, especially when it comes to SGBV and those sensitive things. Now, because of them having the background and the culture, um, on the culture and so forth, uh, they played a huge role in also being able to deal with it, having the understanding of the local population. But I have also experienced in training that we did at some stage on uh, 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 dealing with SGBV and peace operations, where a participant who was preparing uh, to be deployed to a mission um, from, and the person was from Rwanda and have been exposed to the atrocities that took place there, and she was still young, and where even this police officer was breaking down in the class. So I think it's very, uh, 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 when some of the discussions and some of the videos and things were displayed. So I think it's also very important in training that we take cognizance of who are our attendees, know the backgrounds of their countries as well, so that one can prepare for that. And during the one specific exercise where this person broke down, we know that could happen. So we had uh, facilitators monitoring the participants and we would give that person a debrief afterwards as well. So uh, it's not only with the local population, but there are some of our peacekeepers who are, or, or potential peacekeepers who've been exposed to the same situations. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I think that also came out in my, in my research as well on pre-deployment training, but you know, there are instances where um, uh, the assumption, for example, that women are better because they're naturally perceived to be naturally caring, they're better at dealing with um, those that have experienced conflict related sexual violence, but they don't actually understand the psychological processes that individuals go through during um, an attack and after, and they're just taught the process um, through pre-deployment training often. And then from that, they, they struggle to know how to deal with it. But as Hester pointed out, there is that issue of, of the individual um, peacekeepers being traumatized, not necessarily just because they come from a, um, a, a country it, or a state that itself has experienced trauma, um, trauma such as Rwanda, but also they may have themselves had experienced uh, sexual violence in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a country that was peaceful and therefore you know that also needs to be considered um, during these trainings um i i'm just for my final question for you um i'd actually like us to turn now to think at a more strategic level so as we've heard today you know there's 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 there is constantly a kind of pressure if you like for training to deliver and at the strategic level, it's always there in all the UN Secretary General reports and HIPPO, um, Action for Peace, um, a more recent um, uh, UN Secretary General report that has come out on protection of civilians, which uh, in armed conflict, which they're discussing this week at the UN. Um, training is always seen to be a, a requirement and a call for further support. But I wondered from the three of you, what do you think at the strategic level needs to be offered to actually provide training centres and TCCs, PCCs, more support in order for them to more effectively deliver their training? Um, could I ask Michael first, please? That's a good question. Um, I, I worked. I worked um, sometimes with uh, with NATO, and uh, probably the main difference between UN and NATO is that NATO has clearly defined the roles they want to have within the operations. And uh, in UN, it's left to the countries to, as I was said earlier in the, in the discussion, uh, many countries have different um, standards in which they train people for the, for, the, for the missions. And I think that is something which could very much help. There are some, we, we, we work on them 
and we try to implement them. We also work on defining them. We support, uh, especially uh, Switzerland supports a lot in within the UN uh, UN uh, Mine Action Service to define these uh, strategic uh, definitions we, which are needed. But I, I, I suppose it would be very uh, very useful if there is a catalog of uh, of expectations which is given to the nations, and then either you stick to it or you can't go in uh, in a mission and that would be that would increase the level of all the the train the, the the training within all the the uh, uh, the training centers and and probably that would also require then support from the united nations respectively from some nations to support other nations to get to that standard but at least at least uh, then you would be almost secure to come in a mission and have the same standard for each person which is engaged there and i think that's the most uh, strategic uh, struggle you have when you're talking about training and mission together and uh, in that in that uh, room but uh, even even within nato it was not always the same level so it's not um, uh, we we it's not it's not it can't be perfect but at least you try to reach a certain level of training which is equal to each and that's that's about the, the important thing not so much for the it's much more for the peacekeeper itself because the, the the better his training is the more he would be efficient in the mission and it's for the mission themselves it's very important to have a very uh, similar level of training because then you can use the the peacekeepers at a very uh, similar way in a very similar way thank you ramona could i ask you and then i have to to, to end thank you Sure, it's a large question. So I'll focus on just one area. I think, you know, with all of the training centers we work with, they don't always collaborate with each other. The system isn't really built for them to share much information. And and a lot of European countries are actually doing a lot. Um, I, I know Finland in particular uh, has a lot of peacekeepers come from all different parts of the world to their center to train with them. And so I think one strategic level approach could be just more information sharing between the centers. So if one center has a classroom course on a specific topic that they could share those materials with another center that would have the same classroom course on the same specific topic. Um, and, you know, at this point in history, you know, people are doing online training left and right. And so you know, what we're trying to do is find the entities that are doing this and collaborate with them instead of compete against them, because really our funders are mostly the same um, and, and we don't want a duplication of efforts. So I think there's a lot to be done. I, I could probably say more, but that's where I, I think we should focus. OK, thank you. And finally, Hester. Thank you. Um... Yes, from a strategic level, I think one of the shortcomings is that there is not an official UN accreditation system for training. Now, I know that some of the people are against it and they don't want to be prescriptive, but I think it's very important. And, and also what Ramona now said is the sharing of information. Donors provide funding to various training centers. And then they will, the three training centers will each work on the development of a specific program on their own without sharing ideas and their programs will look different. From the uh, UN side, especially on pre-deployment training, it's, there is a guideline to give standards. But to tell somebody you need to spend three hours on this topic and two hours on this topic and so on, still doesn't give you standards because the interpretation and how it is done is not the same. So one, one of the things is, and I'm going to use again the African Union, we, we need to learn lessons from them as well. It's not only uh, the UN providing the support and capacity building to the AU, is are developing pre-deployment standardized packages which give a reader, a facilitator's guide, a participant's journal, and then they do TOTs for the member states. Uh, and especially with this African standby force and so forth, and they do it in a regional way so that then those trainers roll out the same training. 
and and uh, for instance on the police pre-deployment training um, uh, TOTs were done at the Kofi Annan training center at the IPSDC in, in, in uh, 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 Kenya and so forth uh, where trainers from the different countries got together so that might be a way is provide the relevant materials and then enable the countries to continue themselves uh, and one can do it in various ways thank you okay thank you very much so with that final question i would like to um, end this discussion and um, by saying thank you very much to our three speakers ramona tahiri michael fried Weiler, and hester paniras um, we're now going to take a short five minute break um, and we will be returning for the Folk Benedotta Memorial Conversation with keynote speaker Nicholas Haysom, SRSG to South Sudan. So thank you very much.
Oops. Ah. <laughs> okay, very sorry about that. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Karen Von Hippel, uh, the director at RUSI, and it is a pleasure to welcome all of you back for this next panel. Uh, I'm hoping, we're hoping next year we'll be back in our building and we can at least do a hybrid event. So we'll see many of you in person. But it's uh, this is a special part of the peacekeeping uh, conference, which is the Folk Bernadotte Memorial Lecture, Memorial Conversation. Uh, and it's named after Folk Bernadotte, who many of you know is a Swedish diplomat who negotiated the release of 31,000 Jews from concentration camps during the Second World War, uh, and then was chosen by the UN Security Council to act as a mediator in the Arab-Israeli conflict of 47-48. Unfortunately, he was assassinated in Jerusalem in 48 as he was working, and so we we host this panel every year in honor of Folk Bernadotte. And our speaker today, we're really delighted to welcome uh, the SRSG, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for South Sudan and head of the UN mission in South Sudan, uh, Nicholas Haysom. And he has been in place since January 21st. Uh, and Mr. Haysom is a lawyer. He has a long international career, uh, long peace building career. He's focused on democratic governance, constitutional and electoral reforms. He's focused on reconciliation and peace processes. He has served as the UN Special uh, Advisor for Southern Africa and held a number of other uh, important roles in East Africa, as well as in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Nicholas Haysom, who is here in his office uh, in South Sudan. I think he's joining us, right, from your office in South Sudan. Now, what we're going to do today, we don't have a lot of time. We only have about, uh, I think we have about uh, 35 minutes. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to ask Nicholas Haysom a few questions. Um, if people want to ask him questions, there'll be a little bit of time after our conversation. So you can ask questions only on the Zoom Q&A function. If you're joining from other platforms, unfortunately, you can't ask questions. Um, so I think if 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 you're ready to go, uh, uh, Mr. Hayes, let's just start out. What I'd like to do is let's start out with the mission itself. Let's talk a bit about uh, what's happening in South Sudan. Then let's talk a little bit more about the region and then international issues. So let's start out you know, in the center and then work our way out. And if we could just start with the mission itself, um, can you just explain a bit about this mission? I mean, we, we all know that the UN has been involved in South Sudan for decades. Uh, this particular mission, I think, has been around for about 10 plus years. But can you just explain a bit about what the UN is trying to achieve there, what kind of mission it is, if it's an integrated mission, um, et cetera. And then then we'll we'll go deeper into this. So thank you, over to you. Thank you, uh, Karen. Um, perhaps I can give you a little bit of the history because it also demonstrate the range of missions and uh, tasking of missions uh, across a number of years. This was a mission that was originally established after South Sudan became independent and partly to discourage adventurous neighbors from intervention, but partly as a state building and capacity building uh, support program. Um, in 2013, two years after independence, a civil war broke out. It was devastatingly violent. Uh, thousands of South Sudanese sought refuge in the UN camps themselves and in an act which was largely then seen as the first real demonstration of the duty to protect doctrine uh, the UN uh, allowed its camps to be used as places of safe haven for uh, up to 250, eventually 250,000 uh, IDPs. And that really determined its role over the next several years. You will be aware that a peace agreement was signed in 2015. In 2016, another civil war erupted. And in 2018, eventually a uh, peace agreement was inked, uh, which would bring the parties together along an agreed set, uh, a, an agreed roadmap to uh, along a transition, which would culminate in uh, the first really robust 
democratic elections in the country. Uh, th those elections, of course, are still uh, on course or not on course, but they're still to be held. Uh, but after the second peace agreement was signed, it was clear that the mission uh, would have to adopt a broader responsibility to shepherding South Sudan along its uh, transitional pathway um, and would accordingly become involved in much more political processes which would secure an environment which would hopefully uh, entrench peace gains and establish uh, the environment within which uh, elections and uh, constitution making could take place. So the mission really undertook a double pivot. I call it a double pivot. It pivoted towards a more political role from a very light political role, where it had primarily seen its task as protecting uh, those people in its camps, to a role in which it took on board the need to uh, entrench and strengthen and deepen uh, the peace uh, within the country, which is both at the local level between communities. And there's uh, just a number of intercommunal disputes uh, throughout the range of South Sudan, but also at the national level so that the peace agreement could make process. So that really was the double pivot. Uh, I need to say, in, uh, sorry, that's the uh, first of the pivots. The second pivot was to convert it from a largely static mission doing static guarding to one which was able to protect civilians throughout the country and thus was required to be no, uh, mobile and dynamic. Uh, that is a difficult, uh, difficult thing to achieve in South Sudan because South Sudan has very underdeveloped infrastructure. And to a large extent, the mission is held hostage by mud for six months of the year. And that means it's barely functioning for six months because uh, the vehicles can't uh, drive down the roads, the roads are unpassable. Um, and so the desire to be mobile was also uh, to take on the challenge of the climate and the weather. And then of course, just to fill out the picture to mention that the country is undergoing now its fourth year of floods, which have been absolutely devastating, have to be seen to be believed uh, throughout most of its northern provinces, and which complicate the environment within which peacekeeping is undertaken, and within which uh, we try and uh, implement our uh, uh, undertaking to provide safety and security for all Sudanese. The way we've tried to do it is by more rapid patrolling through creating small bases in areas which are hotspots and under those umbrellas of tranquility, providing humanitarian aid or introducing development projects. But in the first instance, always working with peacekeepers in an integrated fashion to create peace dialogues and arrangements between communities which would enable them to live together in peace and harmony. So uh, that's really a, a snapshot um, of, of where we are. I can go into kind of some of the difficulties we've encountered in trying to do that double pivot. Yeah, yeah I, that would be great to hear more. And also how many civilians, uh, uh, UN civilians, and how many UN soldiers are, are in the mission as well? Like, what is that capacity? But then tell us about some of your challenges in the double pivot. It sounds quite extraordinary. For anyone who has been to South Sudan, you know exactly what how challenging some of those, you know, climate-related issues are. Well, to give you a snapshot of the mission itself, it's about 17,000 strong. It's, I think, regarded frequently as the largest of all UN peacekeeping missions. So, uh, uh, there are some other large peacekeeping missions nearby. Um, as a result, let me briefly just describe uh, the, the last uh, couple of months uh, of, our pro of our engagement. We were largely proud uh, and uh, quite happy with the success of our achievement in securing a downward trajectory in the levels of violence over about a nine month, 12 month period. Uh, but all those gains were really eradicated by a spike at the beginning of the year which have seen the mobilization of the White Army and their occupation of parts of the land traditionally occupied by the Shaluk, 
and then later they moved down south into Yongle and uh, engaged in a um, uh, in conflict with the Moor. And as a result, there was a spike in violence. And so we had to ask ourselves, are we having the impact we should have? And in what ways can we improve what we do? And I asked my force commander to review precisely what we had done and what we hadn't done over that uh, three month period at the beginning of the year. And that generated a, uh, a response which was to suggest that we are short, we don't have the kinds of people which can remotely meet the expectations we are generating and the mandate expects of us, and that we needed certainly uh, both uh, aviation capacity and more peacekeepers. We are in the process uh, or have referred that uh, observation to headquarters and they have sent a capability study. So we are currently in the process of examining or interrogating whether we are fit for purpose, particularly in the light of the fact that the country is, is, is shortly scheduled to undergo an, uh, an, a national elections, uh, maybe other levels of elections as well. And that during that process, we will be volatile. There are contestations in at least six, what we call mini civil war spots, uh, which had, uh, conflicts which have taken strong tribal dimensions, presentations, but which are also connected to the principal cleavages in the society. Um, and we are aware that we were able to cope with those conflicts in Upper Nile and Yongle because they were sequential, the one happened after the other. If they had happened at the same time, how would we have been able to discharge our mandate? Uh, the result has been, as I've said, a request, and hopefully uh, we will um, we will receive the kind of assets we think we we need. In the meantime, the Security Council has looked closely at our mandate and sort of doubled down, particularly on the uh, mandate to protect civilians. So a few years ago, they had given us a three-year vision, which primarily concentrated on our role to deepen and make irreversible the peace gains. Now it's really effectively to protect civilians. In our view, it's much the six of one and half a dozen of the other. We simply can't make uh, progress politically if there is a state of generalized violence throughout the country. And we have to be effective at uh, giving ordinary citizens a sense of peace and security if we are to expect them to participate in the constitution making and election uh, exercises. We, this, all of this has coincided at a time in which the UN generally is short of helicopters, to be blunt. And that's been partly a result of the Russian-Ukraine uh, war, uh, which has seen the uh, grounding of most of the Russian, uh, particularly rotor-winged aircraft, and, the schema I've described to you of using TOBs and patrols and getting uh, peacemakers in under the umbrella uh, is very intensive as far as aviation assets are concerned. Mm -hmm. We are not one of the lucky missions in the area which has uh, access to drones. The authorities, the host country here, have made it clear that they would not countenance a UN force with drones, but it uh, continues to be one of the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, that we deal with. Generally, we have had to engage in things like road building and dike building. Uh, in uh, Rabkona, we are uh, engineering assets were primarily responsible for saving maybe 300,000 lives when the dikes collapsed. So is that a protection of civilians function or isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Would have been hard to walk away uh, from the dikes collapsing. So that you know remains an additional objective uh, that we would uh, that we need to do, and we cannot default while we're doing all of these things on providing escorts for our humanitarians uh, to deliver food aid. As you know, two thirds of the population are food insecure. There are famine warnings in respect of some areas, and at the same time, because of the generalized condition of poverty, people haven't planted because of the floods and the conflict. Um, there has been a rise in what I can only call as predatory raiding, banditry, on our uh, delivery of uh, food aid, which is very critical because it's pre 
food aid, which is destined to be pre-positioned to carry communities through the rainy season, which has started this week. So uh, we're desperate to get the, the food aid, uh, WFP's food aid across to communities uh, before the roads close down. And if we don't, we don't we're going to see uh, increased poverty and desperation on the part of communities who don't have don't have food. And of course, all of this at the time in which we've got uh, refugees coming in from on the south. So, um, and, um, so elections are are what this summer, July? Is that right? Uh, elections are scheduled according to the roadmap, which has been signed off by all the parties. For no, about October, November next okay. year. So um, uh, before that, they have to undertake a constitution-making uh, process and agree a constitution uh, six months in advance of the elections themselves. So can um, you talk? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, can you talk a, a bit about your relationship with the South Sudanese government? How often do you meet? Uh, how do you? Uh, work with them on planning for the election? Uh, you know, how intense is that uh, relationship? Well, the, the election, uh, the relationship at the moment is um, really governed by the fact that we are complaining that they aren't making enough progress. Mm -hmm. and that is because we can't really engage with them and provide the assistance that we think we they need and uh, we can deliver until they establish an independent election management body which they haven't done because they haven't passed the law which would stand up that body. So uh, we were a little frustrated. Uh, we anticipate uh, the promise uh, that uh, such a body will be established shortly, uh, that we'll be able to make some progress after that. But the country hasn't made the critical electoral choices it has to make for anything like a, a concrete vision of what an election would be be like uh, in South Sudan. Um, generally, in regard to my, our relationship with the host government, I think uh, both they and we would accept that it's uh, significantly improved over the last year or two. Um, it has its, uh, it has its uh, uh, points of friction and uh, difference. Um, and notably, uh, one of the issues which is the uh, often raised uh, as a criticism of the international community generally, and the Security Council in particular, is the imposition of the arms embargo uh, on South Sudan. Um, for the rest, they seem to appreciate that there is not going to be another extension blessed by the international community in regard to delays uh, on the constitution-making process and the elections. And we have been saying quite repetitively that this is a make or break year. These issues can't be, the processes can't be deferred the next year. They've got to be dealt with this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, maybe we can talk a bit about the region. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's a very unstable region. It has been for some time. Uh, it's not just in Sudan that we've been having huge security challenges, but Ethiopia, uh, Central Africa Republic. I know there have been cross-border issues with Uganda, some with DRC, um, and, and as I mentioned, now uh, with Sudan. Uh, and of course, you know, the South Sudanese government may not be as resilient as it should be to be able to withstand pressures from all of uh, all of this instability in the neighborhood. Um, can you talk a bit about the spillover and how you are managing that, how often you meet with your counterparts or governments in the region. Just tell us a little bit about the impact of all that. It, how much is that derailing your progress that you're trying to make? Yes, I mean, there are a number of hands uh, in the you know, cooking uh, on this issue. So we've taken care not to step in. Uh, as you know, President Kier here has uh, made it clear his intent and uh, uh, wish to be a mediator in the dispute. Uh, as regards the direct effects of the, of the Sudan conflict on South Sudan, it's primarily economic. The food prices have gone up 100, 200%, particularly in the border areas. We've got 77,000 uh, returnees, almost all of them are South Sudanese. So 
we would expect most of them to go back to home communities uh, or the communities from which they'd originally they'd originated. Uh, but we can't guarantee that. We've had two issues where there's been outbreaks of violence between uh, sections of the returnees, generally along tribal lines, but is an indication of what would happen if the returnees continue to come back in numbers and are held up in bottlenecks, in this case in a place called Rent or in Molokal, uh, and what that would mean for, uh, uh, for the country as a whole. What really does worry us is that the oil pipeline might be cut if one of the protagonists in the Sudan conflict decides that in its calculation the flow of oil benefits uh, uh, doesn't benefit uh, its own party or benefits the other one, it may cut the oil. That would mean 90% uh, of all of the money which uh, basically runs this country would stop. I, mean, I dare say that it would really hurt uh, Sudan as well. Um, but that would, we would think, uh, add to the general level of frustration and the predatory behavior we've seen if uh, the poverty continues to deepen and extend. Um, I personally have always been of the view that you can't understand any one country in the Horn without understanding the others. There's a kind of interconnection between all of them and between protagonists and antagonists uh, from one place in, uh, uh, with another. So we try and keep a close uh, watch but also I engage with uh, um, not only my opposite UN numbers, but also government figures in Kenya and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Uganda, in Sudan, uh, and in other places as well. Is EGAD playing a significant role as in, in, in all these challenges? Well, we have wanted it to play that role. It, stand, it stood alone and insisted on its stature as a guarantor of the agreement, and in my view, that carries certain responsibilities, particularly to moving the parties in regard to places where they are stuck, and they are stuck at the moment following the, dis the replacement of the defence minister by the president, the defence minister uh, being from the opposition party. And it's an issue that's not resolved, and people don't seem to have the bandwidth to focus both on Sudan and South Sudan at the moment. And I think that counts particularly for uh, EGAD, but I think EGAD's issue as well is that it has uh, tensions between some of the member states uh, and its president is Bohan himself. So there's a question as to how he would feature in any discussions on resolving the dispute of which he is a party. Mm -hmm. um, there are some who feel he shouldn't be present in that discussion and others who feel he should be. Um, so we're obviously also working closely with the African Union, who we think has uh, it, it has standing and leverage to engage with the parties both here and, uh, and elsewhere, mm -hmm. both in regard to South Sudan issues as well as Sudan mm -hmm. issues. Okay, well, maybe we can pull out a bit to the international uh, aspect of, of what's happening there and the influence and involvement of countries. Uh, I mean, I remember even 15, 20 years ago, China was buying the yacht for <laughs> by Bashir. Uh, China has been invested, as we all know, in you know, oil and pipeline and all of that in the whole region, but in South Sudan too. Uh, Russia is, of course, very involved in the region with Wagner. Um, and I'm just wondering, are you seeing any spillover from, uh, you know, what, from 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 the Russia? I, you mentioned the helicopter. So I'm trying to also combine some of the questions from from the participants because I know we don't have a lot of time. But uh, in terms of Russia and Wagner, are you seeing? Um, have you seen any of the Wagner mercenaries in South Sudan, uh, or are you just hearing about it more from your counterparts in the region? Yeah, quite frankly, we haven't seen much evidence of Wagner in South Sudan. Uh, of course, it may be involved across the border in Central African Republic, and uh, there have been um, there have been some stories uh, from Sudan. Um, generally, the way we would feel it is is whether there was unanimity in the Security Council itself, and generally unanimity is good for us. It means yeah. that. Uh, everybody's on the same page and there can't be any forum shopping and other things 
um, there seems to be an ever deepening split between Russia and China on the one hand and the other members uh, on the other, but it's not quite clear where the African Union th uh, three, as they're called, uh, stand. And perhaps this vote coming up on the arms embargo, in fact, it's taken place, but we don't know what the result is, uh, will give an indication as to where they stand. And, and with China, I know they, uh, at least in the past, I, I don't know now, but they certainly had a number of police uh, in the police parts of the mission and, and peacekeepers. They've been uh, much more involved in peacekeeping than in the past uh, in, in South Sudan. Are they still uh, playing that role? Uh, yes, they do have. Uh, it is one of the few areas where China has quite a significant number of uh, peacekeepers. And in fact, they are the principal peacekeepers in the compound in which I'm based now. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. The only, uh, one. We have a number. And then what about the Gulf? Um, are there countries from the Gulf that are involved outside of the auspices of the UN um, in terms of investments or uh, or is it more in Sudan versus South Sudan? You know, we're finding it difficult to get people to even remember South Sudan which uh, unbelievably you know, is regarded as a zone of tranquility next to all the others. Um, but um, the Gulf is much more engaged in the Sudan issue than I think it is in okay. the South Sudan, which tends to be more transactional, I think. Um, and um, uh, a few people have asked about uh, the impact of climate change. I think you've been involved in South Sudan on and off for decades. I mean, what what do you what do you feel like you've seen in terms of changes? I mean, it's just get, it's going from bad to worse um, in terms of the impact of the rainy season, the flooding, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think the flooding question is a bit more, you know, is, is quite complex uh, and uh, trying to account for the rising level of the. Uh, Nile, you know, it doesn't really flood as such, it just gets higher and higher. Um, uh, but I would imagine that South Sudan would be the clearest example of the relationship between conflict and climate change. Uh, the fact is it's been a driver of tension between communities as they compete for arable land or, or grazing land. Um, it's devastated uh, communities in the north. It's obviously affects different communities differently and some are harshly affected and others not at all. Um, so we certainly uh, keep a close look and we have advisors dedicated to the question of uh, climate change and, uh, uh, and conflict. But we're also conscious of another issue, which is that we want to leave, when we leave South Sudan, we want to leave them uh, with, uh, let's say our legacy projects which would at least include capacity to generate energy we ourselves as a mission consume quite a significant part of the available energy in south sudan but we would also like uh, as far as possible to encourage uh, the biggest portion of that energy uh, capacity to come from renewables and particularly solar power and so we are looking for, and the Secretary General has given a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2030. So we're looking at every way uh, of minimizing our fuel consumption uh, and of making the conversion to renewables. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's a great idea. Um, makes, uh, makes so much sense. Um, and then what about, uh, we've had a few questions about impunity and justice. Uh, you know, this, in a sense, South Sudan has been in some sort of conflict or another for such a long time. Uh, I can't imagine that people have chronicled uh, in a way that could be used by courts all of the various injustices uh, that have happened. How are you thinking through these larger questions of, uh, of justice going forward as, as you know, the rebuilding is continuing to take place and you're you're focusing on um, you know maintaining ceasefires etc well, it's, it's actually one of our major kind of preoccupations and that's because it goes uh, straight to the question of protection of civilians amongst other things 
at least one of the aspects of the cyclical violence we see around intercommunity murders, cattle theft, and so on, is the allegation, quite correct, uh, the fact that there is no proper justice chain in South Sudan. In other words, many areas have no courts, no police stations, uh, no prosecutors. Uh, uh, and um, so they're unable to really deal with the violence which is generating, or deal with the crimes which is generate, which are generating the violence. We've been working on a project whereby we sponsor mobile courts. Mm -hmm. So at least if you can't build a whole court system justice chain in a particular state, you can at least send out, uh, you can at least send out mobile courts. Uh, and in addition, our rule of law unit works very hard with the with the military uh, legal authorities because the military authorities are the only ones with jurisdiction over uniformed soldiers who commit rape and particular conflict-related sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And we've had some success in securing convictions in military courts, general courts martial, uh, in regard to uh, gender-based violence. So, um, but these, of course, they can be criticized as being the tip of the iceberg, but to the extent that they can be publicized and stand as examples, they have a much broader effect than the numbers of uh, people that are actually being convicted. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to emphasize that we see the accountability stroke, human rights stroke, uh, court. Protection of civilians, is right. It's all critical. We wouldn't want to leave here in two or three years' time, let's just say the mission is closed down. And know that we hadn't, in the entire time we'd been here, we'd failed to develop uh, the police as a functioning institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, challenge in so many missions as well. Um, I guess the final question, because I know your your time is precious and uh, we're running towards the end of this is, you know, Rusi is obviously based in the UK. The British uh, government are big supporters of foreign and Commonwealth and Development Officer, big supporters of these missions. Is there more that uh, the UK could do uh, to support you? Okay, I once asked... Besides one, helicopters. <laughs> yes, I once asked one of my uh, um, a military advisors, you know, what more do you need? And of course, uh, it just generated a long shopping list of uh, which usually helicopters are top of the list uh, and then comes other aviation assets. But I think we what we've seen here, you know, is the enormous importance of a wide range of quite technical skills. So, for example... Uh, uh, engineering uh, units have been critical in helping us deal with the uh, damaged roads and uh, flooded and floodwaters. Uh, similarly, on uh, on you know more technical military issues, I, we always welcome the advice of uh, particularly uh, in NATO countries um, in uh, what we do in assessing and interrogating how we do it. Um, we are having an increasing pressure to um, to make sure that our peacekeepers have access to something called 10 to 1, which means uh, 10 1 2. 10 minutes before you have an emergency uh, plaster or aid to storm, then one hour to a, uh, uh, a kind of basic base, and within two hours to a surgery. Yeah. As a rule for every uh, peacekeeper. We just can't do that. Uh, this is uh, this is not NATO, it's, uh, it's South Sudan and the infrastructure just doesn't and we don't have the air assets to be able to comply. So this increasing focus on the training we give soldiers in medical aid, uh, but also on the provision of uh, medical facilities as far as possible uh, to comply with that uh, aspiration. Um, well, thank you very much for that. I think uh, you've you've uh, honored the spirit of, of Folk Bernadotte. Uh, we're really grateful for your time today. I know you're incredibly busy and uh, there's so much going on in your mission. I think the Secretary General is very lucky to have you in place. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we can't all clap for you now, but I think we can maybe do the... Uh, 
Uh, let's just see if we can show our little, <laughs> I don't know where my little clap function is, but can I just, on behalf of all of us, um, uh, can I thank you? And I, I'm about to hand the floor over to uh, Marissa Conway, who's going to make some closing remarks. But before I do that, can I just thank you again, Mr. Hitson, for joining us and for all that you're doing uh, in South Sudan. Really grateful. Well, thank you very much for having me on. And if I can just, before I leave, just uh, remember those peacekeepers who died uh, in the course of their service. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you for that. We will be laying wreaths at the uh, uh, cenotaph uh, as part of the this this event as well. But thank you for that. Um, now let me hand it over to Marissa Conway, the CEO of the UN Association, and thank you again. Hello, all. Um, Karen said, my name is Marissa. I am the CEO of United Nations Association UK. I'm very pleased to be here. It's been such a wonderful conference. I just wanted to make a few short comments before we carry on with our day. Um, before we depart, I want to extend my gratitude to Rusi as our co-host for this event um, and all the hard work they did in organizing this. And I would like to give a shout out as well to my colleague, Bryony, who um, has worked very hard to make sure this conference comes together as wonderfully as it has done. Um, thank you, Georgina, Hester, Michael, Ramona, and Nicholas for your incredible contributions today. I know I speak for everybody when I say how grateful we are for your time and your expertise um, and, and sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, and lastly, just a thank you to everyone who has joined the conference this afternoon. I've gotten so much out of it, and I'm sure you have as well. Um, for those who are London-based, I want to strongly encourage you to come to our wreath laying ceremony on Thursday. It's at one o'clock at the Cenotaph on Whitehall and is a really wonderful way to commemorate um, the lives that have been lost in the line of peacekeeping. Um, having been last year as my first year as the CEO, I can tell you that it's a really beautiful, beautiful, touching ceremony. Um, and so I strongly encourage you to attend. Um, with that, I will, I will say farewell. Um, thank you so much again for your time.